Well, welcome to Ask Us Anything again for another installment. I have uh, with me again this, this nice man that we picked up off the street, uh, Pastor Jesse. We, we're glad to have him. And uh, also with us is Chris Lean. We're going to uh, tackle another question that segues off of what we covered last week, which is kind of the law versus grace and how we live under the law, but under grace. And we're going to kind of try to flesh out more um, with, with the question that we have uh, this round. Okay, so the, the question today is, how do we deal with our guilt and shame in terms of what Christ did for us? Um, because obviously, um, you know, as we mentioned last time, we're living under the law, so there's going to be conviction of, you know, you're not living up to what the standard is, so to speak. Um, and like I did last time, I tried to think of a good example of this. And again, something I read where a gentleman was talking about repetitive sin, you know, the thing that we just can't seem to let go of. And he likened it to every time he engaged in some repetitive sin, whatever that is, it was like him, if you think of the um, the passion and the and the led up to that of Christ, he likened that to each time he engaged in that sinful behavior, that was like lashing Christ with the, you know, a cat of nine tails, which is basically a whip with like nail spikes on it, or, you know, driving the spike through Christ's hand. And yet in this, in this discussion or this thought process he was having as he described it, you know, God never cursed him or said why you know yeah he said why are you doing this but it was in a loving why are you doing this you know I love you I forgive you and yet you're still doing this and I thought that was a pretty powerful way mm -hmm. to think of what Christ did for us and yet how sometimes we just completely disrespect that mm -hmm. And, and what a what a, I mean, kind of a graphic example. Right. Thinking like, whoa, you know. And I, I think that's really good because let's all be fair. We we all struggle with sin. I know right. um, there's there's a thing called Pietism out there where it says I'm constantly moving onward and upward. And, and to a point, yes, that is true. You eventually, with the work of the Holy Spirit, you will become um, hopefully more Christ-like. Uh, you will be in some way. But let's face it, some things. We just can't seem to shake. Right. Like uh, I continue to get angry at my children and lash out at them, or I continue to look at things I shouldn't or do things I shouldn't. So, how how do we deal with this guilt, even though we know that we're forgiven, and um, and under this grace? So, what 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 do you think on that, Jesse? You know, I think we have to make a very clear distinction first of all with the idea of. Um, what repetitive sin is. It always astounds me when people say, well, I'm struggling with this repetitive sin and I can't get, I just can't get over it, whether it's with pornography or alcohol or gambling or whatever it might be. You know, it's a lifelong problem. And I always think to say to the person, well, if it wasn't that sin, it would be a different one. Uh, the fact is, regardless if it's repetitive, you're still gonna sin later in a different manner. Mm -hmm. uh, so who cares if it's repetitive or, it's, or if it comes out in different forms? Sin is sin mm -hmm. in the eyes of God. Yeah. And so I think, first of all, we just need to name that sin, regardless of if it's repetitive or not, brings us into a place of guilt and to some extent uh, is understandable. But I think we also need to make another distinction, which is the difference between guilt and conviction. Uh, guilt and shame are always brought with the purposes to hurt. God does not hurt his children. He convicts his children frequently. I think of, uh, you know, the perfect example of this is Peter, right? Every three to four pages in the New Testament, <laughs> Peter is screwing up. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Every three to four pages, God, you know, Jesus is like, Peter, are you serious? What are you doing? You know, and he's, he's never trying to, sh to guilt him, to shame him as far as going, I want you to feel bad. He's trying to convict and correct to go, you can do better. Right. So I think we have to name that uh, it's important to remember that our guilt does not come from God, but our conviction and our, our, our 
hurt that we cause over that sin does. Uh, there's actually a couple of passages that back that up. There's one in the book of John. I actually marked it before we started. Uh, and it says, it says this, John 3, verse 17 and 18. This is the words of Jesus. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Christ does not condemn us. He does not guilt us, but he convicts us. Mm -hmm. And we know that not only from the life of Peter, but also many of the different times where, you know, in Acts 3, for example, uh, where the scripture says, repent, you know, uh, repent of your sin, repent of your wicked ways. So I think that's big that we need to name that. And mm -hmm. what do we do with that then becomes the question. What do we do with the knowledge that we hurt? you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through our sin. So I don't know, you guys, you guys continue. I said a lot there. Well, I mean, you, I mean, you kind of brought up a good point in there, the word repent. Well, what is that? Yeah. What, what is repentance? And, and what, I, what I have in my mind, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or a different example, repentance is basically, think of yourself as um, God has a target for us, right? He has a target on the wall and it's got a bullseye and he wants us to hit the bullseye. Well, when we sin, we're not hitting the bullseye. It means missing the mark. But we're not shooting even at the target. We're, we're going this way, running away from the target. Well, repentance is, you're going this way. Turn to me. Confess. You receive forgiveness. You, you go this way now. Mm -hmm. that, that's basically how I look at it. And you, I mean, you brought up repentance, so I thought that was a fair point to bring up. Absolutely. That you'd say, Lord, I messed up. I sinned. I know it. Please, please forgive me. And, and, and knowing that he, he is more than willing to forgive. And that's, I think that's important to name also because that's where uh, the God's law is what we're talking about, helps to convict us. Right. That's the part where the law also comes in handy, which is again why we said last time, Jesus did not come to abolish but to fulfill mm -hmm. because it's through that law that we are convicted of repentance. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, repentance, I think that was a great analogy, is basically us not only uh, asking God to forgive our sins, but promising to try and do better, but promising to say, I will give that up, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're going to fail in it, but it's a continual process right. through sanctification. So a good example is, uh, you know, with, uh, let's just say alcohol is your vice, right? Um, and every week you're going out and you're, and you're having way too many drinks and then you come before God and you repent. Just saying to the Lord, all right, Lord, forgive my sins. And then not doing anything about right. it is not repentance. That's just asking for forgiveness, yeah. which he gives, mm -hmm. but it's not, uh, an act of repentance. Repentance says, forgive me of my sins and give me the strength in order to do better next week. Mm, yep. I will promise to try and do better next week with you, the grace of you and your help. Yep. It's giving up something for the sake of Christ. And so that is how the law uh, comes in when it comes to uh, conviction. He doesn't convict us of, or he doesn't guilt us into saying, you're a bad person, how dare you? Because sin has already done that for us. Right. He says, I have saved you from being a bad person. Now go ahead and turn over a new leaf and look at me. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. You got two, two quick points. One is, um, I, I think it's fair to say, right, that one of Satan's greatest tools is to use that guilt and shame and to say, well, gee, God's not going to accept you. You know, you're worthless. And, and I always, I guess, when I feel attacked by Satan, I always try to distinguish, you know, when when that's, it's kind of like that negative self-talk. It's like, no, this isn't of God. God would be saying, yeah, you screwed up, mm -hmm. but I still love you. Mm -hmm. And when those, you know, like, well, you're worthless or you're, God's not, that's not God. I mean, it, it just, it's not, period. Mm -hmm. the, the second point I thought just to, to bring up is I always think of, um, Paul, when he says, well, you know, basically if 
if we're bound to sin, then why not just live her up and sin it up, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet he responds to that. Maybe you guys want to just touch on that a second. Go ahead. I've said quite a lot already this morning. So, <laughs> so basically you said, he says, sin all the more. Right. Okay, so with that, Paul is basically saying, like he says, well, if I'm just going to screw up anyway, what's the point of even trying? What, what's the point of even even uh, confessing to God? Well, I would say to that uh, two things, and you can add to this, is one, while the Spirit works through us and in us, we can't just sit on the chair and do nothing about it. Right. God works through our actions. Now, of course, you could say he'll, he'll make it, you know, it, he's sovereign, and he is. He'll just work through it, and I don't have to do anything. No. Uh, I preached on uh, Moses in and, and Exodus at the burning bush, and God himself comes down and says, and this is in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14 of Exodus, and he says, I myself have come down, this is God speaking, to free the Israelites and do something. But then he looks at Moses and he says, so I'm sending you to go do this. Whoa, that, that sounds like a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. It's, I'm going to do this, but it's going to be through you. And it's the same thing. I'm going to do, I'm going to do work, good works within you, through you, and with you. That's, that's what he's saying. And the second part is, um, it's, it's along this where Jesse said, if you're just going to go on and sin, it's not really repentance, and that's not really uh, um, being sorry for your sin. And, and I would encourage you, if, if there's a sin that you're struggling with, and we all are because we're all sinners, and you don't feel sorry for it, confess that to God and say, God, please help me be sorry over my sin. Mm -hmm. I don't think there, there's any way, shape, or form that you, you're, you're not totally gone. Yeah. God is so merciful and gracious. I mean, even even in the midst of the sin and not feeling sorry for it. You can ask for feeling sorry. Ask for his help no matter what. That, that's what I would say. Romans 6, of course, you know, is, is that, famous, that famous phrase, what then shall we keep on sinning, right? Mm -hmm. And he builds up this argument, and, you know, Paul, he's, since he's one of my favorite characters in history, answers his own question in a very Pauline way. <laughs> uh, he says, by no means, exclamation point, right? No. Nope. <laughs> Shall we keep on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. And he answers his own question by saying, we died to sin. How much or how can we live in it any longer? The moment of justification, which I'm assuming at some point you guys will touch on in regards to what is justification and sanctification. That can be the next question you guys ask if you want. Exactly. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a fancy way of saying the moment that God reveals that he chose you to be his child. Um, and that's different than the moment he chooses you because he always chose you. Uh, see, it's the moment God revealed that you are his child, the moment he gives that revelation to you. But at that moment, we turned from what Paul puts as uh, we, turns, we turn from sinners to saints. And we put off the old flesh and put on the new flesh. And so when he says, should we keep on sinning? He's saying, no, we gave that up. We, we have Christ's life now. We are in Christ's likeness, not in our own sinful likeness, but in Christ's likeness. So the difference being, whereas we used to be sinners who would occasionally see little snapshots of Christ, now we are saints who sin because our old nature constantly tries to grab us back. Mm -hmm. But that's where Jesus says, come to me and repent because you are mine. I claim you. Mm -hmm. So that is how, in my mind, we, uh, we understand the grace and, uh, you know, shame question. It's not shame. It's conviction. And the Spirit convicts because there are things that we in our individual lives struggle with. We do struggle with sin. And unless we repent of those, we can't have a clean heart to come before Christ. So he convicts all the time, but he never does it for the purpose of hurting us. Only to help. Amen. Yep. Amen. You got anything no. last? Okay, um, so to wrap this up quickly, so wherever you are, whatever you've, been, whatever you've done, it's okay. Christ will forgive. And we're through this, going through this sermon series of resting in Christ. 
And so the passage which I'll be preaching uh, on February 14th is, um, and I'll add context to that in the sermon, and Christ says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So no matter what you've done, where you are, what you're doing, Christ says, come to me, all of you who are burdened and weary by your sin. And so the last point I would, I would add is, remember, we're not saved by how well you feel your faith or obedience is or isn't. You're saved by the object of the faith, which is your faith in Jesus Christ. Look to Christ for your salvation and only him alone. So until next time, uh, have a good day and we'll see you soon.